Fix Scott here, and this is the wrap for Friday, May 10th. So after a real choppy, volatile period that went on for uh, more than a month, right here uh, from basically mid-March till May, so about six weeks, we've now broken to the upside. And uh, in fact, this is seven consecutive higher lows. So I'm not going to show you the results of that right now, but I will share that with our members um, Monday morning. But something I stumbled on in the room uh, a few minutes ago, in the trading room a few minutes ago with some members, someone had pointed out how the ATR had compressed. In fact, the five-day average true range, as a geek note, I use the cash index, not the actual instrument of trading for reasons I won't bore you with. Um, doesn't matter. The five-day ATR is now uh, less than two-thirds as big as it was a week ago, which was actually that bar there. So these past five days, this so you go back to then, the ATR then was composed of that bar, that bar, that bar, that bar, that bar, and that bar, but on the cash index. So it's hard to visualize it actually here. Let me, maybe it'll be more obvious. So basically we're talking about the last five bars here versus these bars here because the ATR is inclusive of gaps. It's actually two-thirds as big because we've been consolidating, getting more narrow ranges as the market possibly is running out of steam to the upside. So as I explained to folks in the trading room, my gut, my experience tells me that the odds of range expansion are much greater to the downside than to the upside at this point. So I'm going to be proactively looking for um, opportunities to get short on a low breakout of either the 15-minute or the first-hour range next week. Um, just based upon my experience of this market getting more tightly wound up here with these more narrow ranges. But instead of trusting my experience, let's look at the data. So I put that idea on the line and said, let's check it because it's always important. And I'm wrong plenty of times. That's why I crunch the numbers. So let's look at the results of fading gaps when the five day ATR uh, as of today is only two thirds as big as it was a week ago. Uh, and with the definition, you must also be in a bullish market above the 10 and above the 200 day moving average. There you go. A uh, slight bias for gapping down on the subsequent day. Uh, both have about typical fill rates, actually, a little bit better for gaps down in terms of end of day probabilities. You generally expect about 70% of all opening gaps to fill by the end of the day. That's not what's interesting about this. What's interesting is look at the profit factor. You've made your winners have made twice as much as your losers have lost using an end of the day stop for the shorts, but the longs have lost 50% more than they've made. So what this tells you, several different ways. In fact, look down here. This is really what it tells you. Look at the average losing trade. So going along for these 16 losing trades, you lost an average of over 10 points, 11 or 12 points. Uh, going along, holding till the end of the day. Even if you got rid of that one giant losing trade, it's still a, a pretty bad number. Certainly a lot smaller than this number, because right now it's three to one. The average loser on shorting an up gap and holding till the end of the day, after you've had some narrowing of the average true range, the five-day average true range, is much smaller. In fact, we looked at these numbers, and the reason it's much smaller is you have a bunch of end-of-day stops. Correction: with an end-of-the-day stop like here. Um, you just don't get range expansion. I even looked at it with our MTG stop parameters, and it was a similar concept. Even those weren't being hit very often. So the market could be running out of steam is the way I would interpret this data. And if you get an opportunity to, um, to do a breakout short to the short side, you may want to consider that because we're due for some range expansion to the south side. Hopefully that made some sense for you, and it's helpful for the coming week. So let's look at today let me show you the worksheet first this is the average of the eight individual gap guides and it showed any gap up was shortable today any gap opening between the high and the close based upon the average of all eight indices individual gap guides or even above the highs so um, I did hear from some folks that went short uh, pre-market or the overnight session in part because these numbers were really supportive of shorting up gaps, meaning the odds of the gap filling were very high, above average. So we open in this area. If you look at the individual gap guides, whoops, 
Check out these numbers real quickly. DOCs in. We were opening between yesterday's open and yesterday's close. Strong numbers for the ES. Look for a minimum of 60% win rate and 1.3 profit factor. Check. Uh, Dow, uh, slightly attractive. Doesn't quite meet my profitability factor. Um, the UH, technically the NASDAQ opened in the UHC zone between yesterday's highs and close, but those were really strong numbers. Big check there. And then the Russell checks. So a three out of four meeting my criteria for shorting up gaps. Let's see, looking at the ETFs. Spider also confirmed what the ES showed. The diamonds look good. The UHC zone for the Qs looked really good. And then the Russell DOC zone looked good. So seven of the eight met my criteria. The one that didn't just barely missed it. And what also stood out was look at these percentages here. Opening between the high and the close today, 85% of the time the extended target was hit if it filled its gap. And the PF was about 100%. Whenever you have a profit factor, for the extended target that is almost identical to the overall profit factor for going for gap fill, you know it's made a bunch more money, not a little bit, a bunch more, possibly twice as much money holding for the extended target. It's just the way the math works because it's a ratio of gross profits to gross losses. Um, you'd have to put some pen to paper to probably see that or visualize it, but just trust me, the average um, winner is much bigger in this scenario. So. This says consider extended target. There were you no know, unique day factors in play, no unique patterns in play. Um, from our core database, does a little additional work as I always do, and show that generally, as I showed last night's video, up gaps are problematic after a 200 day high that was not a 200 day high close. But if the gap was small to mid size, less than 40% of the five day average true range, these numbers are really good. In fact, what that tells you is that the five. Um, there were five losers, 0 for 5, on the large gaps up after the scenario. So the small and mid-sized gaps were okay. I didn't know that last night when I did the video, but uh, stumbled on it this morning. That's why I shared it. Uh, up gaps on Fridays after a lower close that was preceded by a 200-day high close. 9 of 11. All 9 hit the extended targets and doubled the profits. Um, so we had some other positives. And that's basically what it said. Attractive setup. Worksheet generally positive for shorting up gaps. So as long as we had at least a point of opportunity opening greater than 1625.5 and all the other markets had to open up too, I'd fade the open the half size position and hold half for the extended target of 1623. In fact, if I weren't in a drawdown, I'd have probably gone the whole position for the extended target. Lots of data favoring the extended target. And... As it turned out, and I was probably, uh, someone probably messaged me, said I was unusually bearish today. And I clarified to them, unusually bearish as it relates to the extended target being hit. So, in fact, I didn't, going back to that, I said specifically extended target area of 1623, which is where it was per our guides. And this is just luck, by the way. I'm not this good, nor is the data that accurate. The low is 16... Where was it? Oh, it was right over here. Went right to 1623. One of these bars. Oh, it's right here. Third bar went to 1623. So it ended up being a three quarter tick gap. So it missed filling me by two ticks, right? Because it needed to open greater than 1625.50. So it wasn't quite bit, big enough, but it went right down to 1623. So that was a two and a quarter point move. You know, not big, but okay. Then we bounced. Look like we may continue to the upside. I was going to do a discretionary long here. Um, unfortunately, I had a, a personal conflict that came up. Told folks that I still liked it. Did not take it, as I explained, before it even triggered down here. Um, and sure enough, it would have been a loss because I was using three-point stop. So I got lucky on that. And see on the breakouts the data was just too neutral all the way around the advanced studies actually showed some significant risk for doing the low breakout today and sure enough I think you would have some of the data it just wasn't compelling but even if you were leaning that way some of them were leaning that way the advanced studies showed that there was real problems the uh, advanced studies did favor the high breakouts today those and I think uh, in the Russell specifically in those work so a quiet day for me I did no gap trades no range trades and um, what else was of note? Oh, we ran a study looking at on Friday specifically during these bullish markets. You know, it was one of the filters. I can't remember what it was. I think following a 200-day high, a 200, 
a 20 day high that's what it was on a friday the selling was generally over by 12 to one o'clock and it bottomed right there i was just a little bit of luck there as well so um i did get a couple of nice emails on that uh, anyhow i didn't make a penny today but i didn't lose a penny either and i can live with that so um we'll uh, see what next week brings us should be some good movement and uh, have a great weekend take care Thank you.